CNN senior national security correspondent Alex Marquardt is back with us. Alex, uh, we're hearing words like uh, nullified, humiliated. These are words that Vladimir Putin does not like. Uh, what are some of the diplomatic challenges of dealing with a politically wounded Vladimir Putin? Huge diplomatic challenges, Jim. Huge security challenges. Remember, this is a man who's in charge of the world's biggest nuclear uh, arsenal. Uh, any Putin watcher will tell you that if Putin is backed into a corner, that makes for a very dangerous Putin. We have never seen uh, a challenge to his authority like this. As you mentioned, these, these Wagner troops uh, getting within 125 miles, 200 kilometers uh, of the Kremlin, his weakness has been exposed. And so he is going to have to reassert himself uh, in a way that demonstrates to the world and demonstrates to his country uh, that he is fully in power. The U.S. is going to have to navigate this carefully, and we're already starting to see that. Uh, Arlette touched on the fact that the U.S. has had a very hands-off approach, uh, making clear trying to make clear to the world that they really didn't have any role in this, that they certainly are not supporting Prigozhin on his march uh, to Moscow. But Jim, at the same time, obviously watching this very carefully, and we are told that the intelligence community did see this coming, that uh, in the past few days and weeks, they've really seen planning for this. They've seen uh, Wagner troops getting into position, uh, equipment and, and, and weaponry on the move. There was a briefing, we're told, uh, midweek, by intelligence officials to the Gang of Eight in Congress, which includes the heads of the House and Senate Intelligence Committees, essentially telling them that this was imminent. Let's take a listen to Mike Rogers, the head of the House Intelligence Committee. The Intelligence Committee was very much aware that the conflict between Progrosin and, and Putin uh, was uh, inevitable. This is not a weekend trip he's taking, taking his convoy and his military convoy up uh, to Moscow. There's a number of accomplices, including, as we saw, some of the Russian people on the border with Ukraine who clearly support the Wagner Group, uh, in, in contrast to their support for the Russian government. Uh, this is something that would have had to have been planned for a significant amount of time to be executed in the manner which it was. So that was Mike Turner, the Republican head of the House Intelligence Committee, uh, indicating that this was uh, very much known by the intelligence community. Uh, Jim, what was not uh, expected was the lack of resistance to these Wagner forces. I'm told a U.S. assessment uh, thought that there would be a lot more violence, a lot more bloodshed uh, as Wagner tried to get uh, head north and, and get to the Russian capital. All right, Alex Marquardt, thank you very much for that. Uh, at this hour, we still do not know where Vladimir Putin is. Ukrainian President Zelensky said yesterday the Russian leader is, quote, very afraid and was no longer in Moscow. Uh, with me now is Yuri uh, Shvietz. Uh, he studied with Putin at the KGB Institute uh, and worked as a Soviet spy in Washington. Uh, Yuri, uh, thank you very much for joining us tonight. I, I can't imagine uh, there are a whole lot of folks out there who might have better insights into what has occurred this past weekend than you do. Um, wh what do you think? How do you think Putin is reacting to uh, reacting to this near insurrection, and at the same time, why isn't we? Why is it that we have not seen Putin uh, since that angry statement that he put out uh, just about 24 hours ago? Thank you for having me, Jim. Um, first, uh, I believe this is a disaster for Putin, and he understands. He realizes this is a disaster, and according to his practices, in similar situation, he digs into a hole and stays there as long as possible. This is what he is doing right now. And um, the last two days, it was the final act of defeat of Putin, Putin's image, which he, he has been building since the year 2000. Uh, since the beginning of the aggression into Ukraine, uh, he destroyed reputation or a myth about the Russian army being the second best army in the world. Now this is the second army in Russia after Wagner, apparently. And yeah. over the last two, year, uh, two days, he showed that uh, his grip on power in Russia is almost non-existent. He balances, over the last 20 years, his act was to balance between different factions. He does not, he does not do, he, he is not in a position to do it anymore. He controls yeah. the country as a mafia-style organization. And uh, well, so he lost control this question. over his how, how humiliating is it for Putin to be challenged by someone like Prigozhin, to, to essentially have Prigozhin 125 miles or so 
from Moscow, somebody who was once his protege. Exactly, exactly, because uh, Prigozhin, especially, especially the train of Prigozhin, because for Putin it was a lap dog. Prigozhin, as a personality, was created by Putin. Essentially, before, we, before they met, Prigozhin was a two-time hardcore cr uh, uh, criminal, hardcore criminal. And this is Putin who made him very rich, famous, and powerful. So Putin can see this as a real betrayal. And as he used to say it in the past, there is one crime which he cannot pardon, and this is betrayal. But this is what he did yesterday. He not just pardoned, he disavowed. Yeah, uh, what do himself. you make of this deal that they and made? They, they made this deal where uh, Prigozhin gets to leave for Belarus and uh, his mercenaries and Wagner are folded into the Russian military. And it, that, that is that all is forgiven? Can you believe that? Well, this is what not just I cannot believe. Well, I have difficulties to believe, but most Russians hardly can hardly believe because it's a, it's a clear humiliation. More than so, even more so, because uh, what we know so far, this is an official part of the arrangement. But sources close to Kremlin, they say that there is one very important point of the real arrangement, which is not, he has not been announced. And this is Shoigu, the defense minister, and Gerasimov, the chief of staff, will go into retirement. They will not be fired in disgrace, as uh, Prigozhin demanded, but they will be moved into retirement. And it was a single, explicitly formulated demand of Prigozhin. And let me ask you this. Um, how is Putin uh, going to survive this politically? Uh, I, we were talking about this with other guests during this program that I know from Russian history and the history of the Soviet Union, generational change in Russia or the Soviet Union, for that matter, can happen very quickly, very suddenly, and take the world by surprise. Do you, do you think something like that could happen and bring about the end of Vladimir Putin? It's hard to say, because Putin's personnel policy over the 20 years in power was to nominate among his subordinates people who are not intelligent, not, they have no guts, they, most of them have no entities whatsoever. So they like, you know, like gray my, mice, as he used to say. So uh, it's hard to imagine that these people can commit a coup d'etat. Prigozhin, two times convicted criminal, Putin's chef, he dared to do this by the high-ranking military FSB, they, they, they did it there. So the country is right now is basically in a free fall. I mean, in terms that the system of control and governance is almost destroyed. I don't know how they're going to repair this, but what is important to understand, in similar circumstances, Putin's tactic is to fight back with threats, with bluff. Most of them, all those threats are bluff, such as, you know, brandishing nuclear weapons, tactical uh, use, use of tactical uh, new, use of nukes in Ukraine or elsewhere. I can tell you on the basis of one professional experience, this is the bluff which goes back to the days of the KGB. Very interesting. All right. Well, and you would know that subject well. Uh, Yuri Shevets, uh, thank you very much for joining us. We'd love to have you back and continue having uh, this conversation. It's very important. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you for having me. All right, we appreciate it. Amid the chaos in Russia, Ukraine's military says it is gaining ground around the city of Bakhmut. CNN's Nick Payton Walsh is in Kyiv for us. Uh, Nick, uh, Ukraine clearly wants to capitalize on this power struggle in Russia. Can they do that? Yeah, that is the ultimate question, certainly in Kiev for the days ahead. You were hearing there about the acute level of chaos that may still yet be to become in Russian top brass ranks, whether or not the defense minister and the head of the Ukraine campaign end up leaving their jobs. Now, it is unclear at this stage what level of turbulence the move by Wagner towards Moscow has caused on the front lines. Many argue that Wagner was not necessarily involved in frontline fighting. Certainly those units that made that move were adequate 
adequately prepared and have been away from the front for some time. But what has this done to morale? Certainly Ukraine is saying they've managed, and they're relatively obtuse by what they say here, to move forward one or two kilometres on the outskirts of Bakhmut. And today they, without any real specifics, suggest that they had some progress in the Tavria direction. That's essentially in Zaporizhia, where many believe in that southern area Ukraine wants to make a breakthrough to cut the Crimean Peninsula occupied by Russia off from Donbass and the Russian mainland proper. So suggestions that we might be seeing some kind of progress, but it's very hard to get specifics. And I think, too, uh, probably a sense of uh, cautious timing here amongst Ukrainian uh, military. They don't want to move necessarily too fast without being fully apprised of exactly how things have changed along the front line. But they certainly don't want to wait so long for the chaos to subside in Moscow that that moment is indeed passed. So utterly vital that Kiev seizes this moment for its benefit. Jim?